So good evening, everyone. I am Natalia Di Antonio. I am the Islamic postdoctoral fellow here at the Bard Graduate Center. On behalf of the director, Susan Weber, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Bard Graduate Center here tonight for the final lecture for this semester on Jewish material culture. I want to thank the Levan Levy Foundation and the David Berg Foundation for their support for this lecture series and this initiative. I welcome all of you here in this room and those of you watching around the world and in the future on BGC TV. The Bard Graduate Center also wishes to acknowledge that its intellectual and social life here on West 86th Street on the island of Manhattan unfolds on the ancestral and current homeland of the Lenape people. Frankel's lecture tonight is the fourth in a series of five lectures. Laura Liebman gave the second lecture series, which focused on Jewish families in early New York from the 17th through the middle of the 19th century. Born out of her lectures is a book titled The Art of the Jewish Family, A History of Women in Early New York in Five Objects. The launch event for her book will be on March 23rd, here in this room. Professor Miriam Frankel has been our guide these past two Wednesdays, lecturing on Jewish material culture that is evident in the Geniza documents. Miriam Frankel is associate professor at the Department for Jewish History at the School for History at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Her BA, MA, and PhD are all from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Frankel has been a prolific writer. She's the author of six, six book collections of documents, notably her book, Texts as Objects, Objects as Text, was recently published in 2013. She has also edited seven collected volumes. In the first part of her lecture series, Ma'am Frankel provide us with the rich historiography of the Geniza documents. Last week, she turned to the material of those who inhabited the world of books, what they were and how they adorned themselves. And tonight, we will return to this material world, touching upon the consumption of food and the materials used to prepare it. So it's my pleasure to welcome Ma'am Frankel. No, something happened here. Okay, now you had the chance to see the whole lecture from <laughs> today. Um, oh yeah. Um, From here, probably. Yeah. You can do this. No. Um. Is it on the laptop? Do you mind if I no. open this? Something, something went wrong, but perhaps. <laughs> Let's hope it's, it goes on okay. Our, uh, first of all, thank you so much, Natalia, for the introduction. And thank you all for coming. Uh, our three lecture series opened with a message about the revolution of the book. The 300 years between the 10th and the 12th centuries, centuries, usually termed as the classical Geniza period, were actually the, uh, the era of the book itself. Books spread in the world of Islam among Muslims, Christians, and Jews alike, bringing about a profound revolution. The role of the written word increased Significant, significantly, and the society went through a process of textualization which made it the world's most bookish society at the time. Reading has sharpened seeing 
And seeing has not only enriched reading and writing, but has also brought about a new mode of observation, an increased tendency of people to observe themselves and others. The increased ability to observe and differentiate resulted in an incredible sensitivity to colors and shades, but also made people more aware of others and more conscious of their own visibility towards others. To use Roland Barthes' terminology, it raised the threshold of embarrassment. It is this new sensitivity and not only religious commandments that generated a new code of dressing, according to which the body is expected to be entirely covered by many layers of clothing. The dressed body, as I argued in the last lecture, turned to be a sublime expression of civility, an emblem of humanity itself. The house, being another manifestation of material culture, was part and parcel of this revolution. Most of the Geniza people, those Jews who wrote and made use of the Geniza documents, were city dwellers. Inside the various Islamic cities, we find during the classical Geniza period, Jews living in almost any possible place in the various Islamic cities. Exclusively, Jewish quarters are very rarely mentioned. As a matter of fact, I can think only about three cases in which uh, an exclusive, I mean, a Jewish quarter is explicitly me mentioned. That's Kairawan or Kirwan, nowadays Tunisia, Mahal uh, al-Kubra in the Nile Delta, and uh, Mosul in southern I Iraq. In a typical Islamic city, more or less like in the US today, there were many neighborhoods, predominantly Jewish, but hardly anyone which were any, any neighborhoods which were exclusively so. In Fostat and Alexandria, for example, for example, even in predominantly Jewish areas, we find that at least half of the houses have non-Jewish neighbors. The instances of Muslim and Christians renting houses or apartments from Jews or vice versa are extremely common. Many houses were held in partnership by members of different religious communities. Even charitable foundations belonging to the Jewish community used from time to time to rent the removable properties to non-Jews. This, for example, is an agreement between a former husband and wife concerning the distribution of their joint immovable property. The house they owned is demarcated since there were no official addresses, so the house had to be demarcated by other house which bordered it. And we can see that on one side, I mean, some of you perhaps can see that on one side, it bordered on the Ka'itzwede al-Kadi, Thikat al-Dawla, a Kadi. The house was just near the house of, of, a, kad, of a Kadi, a Muslim Kadi, of course. And here it, uh, it, uh, it bordered on a, a, a house called, known as the house of Abu Mlich al-Nasrani, Abu Mlich the Christian. This is a reconstruction of the location of a Jewish house in Fustat. And we can see the, this is the house itself that we can see that it is very close, almost adjacent to the house called House of the Jewess. Now, it makes no sense to call a house, a, the House of the Jewess, Jewess in a Jewish quarter. So this is one, one way really to, to understand that the, the neighborhood was uh, very, uh, uh, very mixed. Uh, here you have the House of uh, Taib the Christian. Up there is the, the house of Halabi, the Muslim. Yeah. Um, here, on the, on the left, there's a road called uh, Mikhail Lane, and I assume that it was, what, it was called after the church of St. Michael. And uh, the house of Abdallah, the scribe, could be anyone, Jew, Christian, or, or Muslim. And uh, the man with a long neck also could be just anyone. <laughs> Uh, the basic form of urban dwelling docu documented in the Geniza was a dar, 
a dam in the court, a, a court uh, house. It was a multi-unit building whose size and internal organization varied widely from very small self-contained structures containing one or two internal apartments to very complex compounds comprising numerous buildings, each containing several individual living areas. All of them surrounded one joint common court. This is why it is called a courthouse or a dal. Most dars belonged to several owners who were by no means always genealogically re related. Non-kin and even Jews, Muslims, and Christians routinely shared possession of a sing one and single property. The multiplicity of property transactions and relocations documented in a Geniza show that houses were frequently divided, divided into smaller units or extended by joining several units together. This points at the elusiveness of houses, which could fre frequently change their shapes, their dimensions, and their destinies. Let us take a short tour in a typical urban house of this period, as mirrored in the Geniza documents. But perhaps a word of caution, a word of warning is, will be in place. We have to remember that Geniza provide us, provides us with abundant information about Jewish houses in the big cities of Islam. But, but since most of its documents were produced by upper middle class merchants, it is, mo it is mostly their houses that we get to know. Almost no information can be gathered concerning the dwellings of the poor, of the lower classes, and not also of the upper, upper echelon. Therefore, the following description, which is mainly based on Geniza findings, reflect mainly the average middle class dwellings. Let's start with the street. It may seem quite narrow to our modern eyes, but it is actually wide enough for pedestrians, for mounts, donkeys, mules, horses, to walk along it quite at ease. We can see that houses stand hand, head to head on a line along the street, and usually they share a, a joint wall. We enter the house through an arched gateway with two door leaves. In many cases, we'll find two entrances, one leading inside the house, to the house itself, the other leading directly to the inner court, to the, to the common court, the car. We can see that above the door, extending out of the wall, there is a bay window, a kind of alcove, allowing the inhab inhabitants to observe what is going on in the street. It is usually called Roshan, which is a Persian name, or uh, sometimes the Hebrew Aramaic word Gzustra is used. It has a wooden latticework screen, Mashrabiya, which enables the person who stands on the balcony to watch what's going on in the street without being seen himself. Beside this window balcony, a house would also have regular glass windows. And uh, we may, uh, we should perhaps note that glass windows were introduced in Europe only from the 13th century onwards. We enter the, the home through a curved vestibule called Dihilis. At this point, when we stand in, in the Dihilis, already inside the house, but the inner part of the, of the house is still invisible. It is the curb, curved format of the corridor which does not allow any look in the inward, intimate parts of the house. On the corridor's two sides, there are built-in stone benches, mastaba, on which big water jars stand. They contain drinking water, which is brought from the Nile by water carriers who would dispose of their load at the, at the doorway. The jars themselves are made of unglazed terracotta put into special marble stands called kilga. Now, there are samples of this kind of kilga at the, here at the Metropolitan Museum. 
And uh, it is, it perhaps doesn't look like, like it, but it's, it's a very sophisticated device. The jar upon should be made out of porous clay, unglazed, and it allows the, the, the water inside to evaporate and accumulate in here in the hollow trunk behind, behind, uh, beneath it. The water then flows to this small projecting uh, uh, vase, accumulate here, and uh, when it arrives here, it is already uh, cool and uh, filtered, um, and uh, you can ladle it, put it in a cup, and have a nice cup of clear, clean, and cold and cool water in the in summertime. Uh, this is very necessary since the uh, the Nile water, which was the main drinking water at this time, or any other river beside beside the city, was usually quite heavily polluted and uh, also fill uh, with, um, uh, with silt. So it had to be filtered, and this, it was filtered in, in this way. From the corridor, we enter the ground floor, the car, which consists of a courtyard and a large living room, a majlis. Uh, this is a 14th century house. Still, I don't know if it still exists, but the, at the beginning of, uh, at the end of the 20th century, it still stood in Egypt. Uh, a very old one, and you can see that it really reflects also the houses, the, the Geniza houses, the houses that we can reconstruct from the Geniza. Uh, and this is the car. This is the main ground floor. Uh, the ground floor consists of this majlis and the courtyard itself there, which sometimes had also a garden. The majlis, this room, literally sitting room, is a one very large social room, living room, if you want. It is here that the social life of the family, with or without the guest, takes place. The white space is usually void of any furniture, but it is divided by curtains, as you can see here. Now, I have to comment that this is a much later picture. It's a, a, the, the house itself is an Ottoman house, so it has many details, furniture and so on, that you would not find in a Geniza house, in a typical Geniza house. But still, it mirrors in some way, in many ways, the, the typical medieval house. Here you can see clearly the way that the, the, the wide space is divided by textiles of all kinds, by curtains, um, and also by this elevated, this elevated um, part of the house, which is called Iwan, and we'll talk about it later on. Um, um, we can see that well, we can't really see it, but I can tell you that the, the walls themselves were decorated with wall hangs of textile, beautiful textiles. Um, uh, uh, the carpets, mats, and colorful, colorful, colorful cushions of all of various forms and sizes were scattered on the floor instead of chairs or armchairs, with, which were not there. These textiles are not only decorative items. They are actually store of household, household wealth, a form of currency, as a matter of fact, with which one could pay, actually pay his dues or taxes if needed. Fatimid Egypt was famous for its luxury textile production. Some of them were found in archaeological excavations and are exhibited in several museums all over the world. This one is from the Textile Museum in Washington, Washington DC. A large chimney-like construction inside is installed inside the majlis. This is the wind catcher, Malkaf or Bahadanj. Yeah. It is a device intended to carry fresh air from above the roof into the inner parts of the house. It is large enough to allow people to sleep in it in summer when they want to enjoy the cool wind of the night. Uh, by the way, in the 50s of the previous century, I know that uh, the Egyptian architecture, Fatri Hassan, 
tried to introduce, to reintroduce this device as to, to Egypt, especially to the countryside. He was enthusiast, enthusiastically supported by uh, the, the um, Egyptian uh, president at, at this time, Abdel Nasser, Jamal Abdel Nasser. He even published several artic articles in Western uh, journals, but I, I don't know what ever happened to this uh, uh, to this uh, uh, project. Um, another device that we find right in the middle of the living room uh, is a small basin with a fountain. It's called other fiskia, either fiskia. This is a fiskia on the right side, a basin with a fountain inside it. This is a more la elaborated fountain. And this is called Shadirwan, which is a kind of inclined, inclined slab over which the water flowed into a basin. Uh, all these were devices, a kind of medieval air conditioner, if you like, and they really help people to survive or to live comfortably during the hot days, especially during the summer. The mass, the ma oh, uh, the majlis is lightened by numerous candle hold, holders or candelions. Some of them, as you can see, are real pieces of art. The majlis is joined by two accessory rooms called akmam, kum in the singular, which literally means sleeves. So the whole ground floor is hence apprehended as a kind of dress, a kind of t-shirt, if you like, with sleeves in it on its two, two sides. A wooden door separates the majlis from the staircase to the upper floor. It is usually a heavy door of carved wood. The Fatimid <coughs> artists were known for the unique art of wood carving, characterized by an intricate high relief technique. The mastery of the material enabled them to carve the wood to different depths to produce a contrast between light and dark. And the carving like this adorned the ceilings and doors of caliphs, palaces, mosques, synagogue, synagogues, and also of residential houses. Oh, here you have, by the way, a wooden bath taken from the Ben Ezra synagogue. That's a synagogue where the Geniza was found. It's nowadays in the Israel Museum. It's a dedication bar. Two brothers dedicated it in the synagogue in memory of their late uh, uh, brother. Um, some more, yeah, this is also from a synagogue. Um, okay, we may now climb up the stairs to the upper floor, the Rulu, we'll keep this for later. <laughs> the upper floor is intended for habitation. It has a washroom paved with marble, a kitchen, which in several places, in several places there are recesses in the wall or stone benches. with mattresses and cushions on them. These are the sedillas intended for repose during the day. The floor here and the upper floor is not even. It has several levels, which divide the wide space into smaller units and renders a sense of intimacy and privacy. The kitchen and the washroom are connected to an urban system of water pipes. Um, the washroom itself, it's called justice in English in quite a few terms. A mirchad, washroom, Beit el Ma, room with water, Mustaham, bathroom, Mustarach, restroom, Murtafak, convenience, Kuch Muracham, a cabin paved with marble, and a Hebrew term also, Bet Kise room with a chair, although I doubted whether any chair was really provided. The roof above was flat, or is flat. It is only the public buildings, the mosques, the synagogue, or the church that have domed roofs. Now what mostly strike Western observers in this house is the total absence of furniture, 
and the seemingly unstructured space with no clear division between distinct areas within the house. In spite of the rich architectural nomenclature found in the Geniza, we would look, we would look in vain there for such terms as a dining, dining room or a bedroom, let alone children's room. In the winter, one slept in a kum, the small closet adjacent to the majlis. In the summer, one sought relief from the heat in the spacious majlis with its ventilation devices. Meals were taken where it was appropriate according to the circumstances. No fixed table with chairs around. Food was brought from the kitchen on large trains and put on movable low stools. This stands up in contrast, in sharp contrast, to the perception of a Western residential house. Most of us, even if we live in very different houses, share a similar image of a house which corresponds more or less to Richard Scarry's rabbit family house. Yeah. A house in which space is tightly constructed, disciplined, and clearly divide, divided into inner small divisions, which are hierarchical. There's a parent's area, children's room up here, um, uh, guest's area, uh, also functionally, it's also divided functionally, kitchen, bathroom, um, bedroom, and so on and so forth. It contains many objects. Each has its own distinctive and precise function, special chairs for the dining rooms, a special a special tool to sit on to take off your shoes, um, a, a special stool for the telephone. Uh, I had it here somewhere in the, in the um, well, I can't find it right now. Here, here it is, yeah. A special stool for the telephone, if you still remember what uh, the, the used to be such a device. And uh, many, many objects which are very, very uh, uh, defined, very, very strictly defined. And generally speaking, it conveys a desire to achieve full control over the nuclear family. Now, unlike this rigid construction, Geniza houses were fluid and modular. Built-in benches and sofas, as well as cabinets, placed in the recesses of the wall, made the house both spacious and easily convertible. A central re reception hall and a central courtyard connected the various parts of the house. Just as the untailored sheets of textiles of various sizes and shapes bound together by a central band could make an elegant and civilized dress, so was the spacious, the large, seeming, seemingly unconstructed house connected by a car and a courtyard, a convenient home which provided both, no, which provided both conviviality, conviv conviviality and privacy. In spite of the lack of permanent furniture, or perhaps thanks to its absence, the houses of middle upper class medieval Jews betrayed a highly developed type of urban habitation. They could provide both, as I said, conviviality and privacy. They were dynamic, flexible, modular houses which could be divided in many creative ways or expanded by adding extensions and new units. This displays a totally new architectural perception, significantly different from the ancient Egyptian, Israelite, Greek, or Roman architecture. It is closely related to the great development of textiles with their precious fabrics and spectacular color colors, which served not only for clothing, but also for seating, bedding, carpets, and hangings inside the house. But how did contemporary people perceived of houses. What did they mean for them? The following Geniza letter, written in the, late 11, in the late 19th of the 12th century, provides us with a description of Maimonides' house as remember, remembered by the author of the letter, who recounts an unforgettable meeting with Maimonides, which had taken place a long time previously in Maimonides' private residential house. 
it's in it's in your uh, handouts. I hope you have them. No handouts. Okay, so I'll read it aloud for you. Perhaps we can still uh, distribute them uh, because I'll, I have several. Okay, I start to read it and uh, and that will go on. So uh, we start with we start with the first page, the rector uh, of the letter. It is it is missing as so often happens in Geniza documents, and it starts more or less in the third line, which says, "Al Fahar, that's a private name. May God protect him." went with us when we set out for Rabbi Moses. Rabbi Moses is certainly Maimonides, Moses ibn Maimun. But he, al fahar preferred for his part to remain at the entrance to the house, while I and Al-Jalal, Al-Jalal is a small boy, proceeded to enter. I kissed his noble hand of Maimonides, and he received us with a most cordial welcome. He said to me, Come and be seated, young man, beckoning me to sit. On the edge of the diwan, opposite, where he himself was seated, while he sat at the, uh, while he sat at the other end of the iwan. I'll talk about it later. So I sat down while he read the message, which I gave him from beginning to end. He was delighted with the presence and started to play with Al-Jalal, with a small boy. May God protect him. There was no one else seated on the Iwan save him, Rabbi Avraham. Uh, Rabbi Avraham is Maimonides' son, Abraham ibn Maimon, and myself. Now we proceed to the verso, to the other side of the letter, of the page. And uh, then there transpired that which a book would prove insufficient to describe. Next, caskets were brought, and he began to eat, lemon, to eat lemon cakes. We stayed just for a while, but he detained me in order that we confer a moment confidentially. The master seemed favorably inclined. In the meantime, Rabbi Avraham, Maimonides' son, may God protect him, had taught Al-Jalal a term with which to address Rabbi Moses. Upon his reciting it, Rabbi Moses laughed with amusement and sported with the child. I was the first to leave the house, while Al-Jalal remained behind, talking to the usher in the vestibule. Whereupon Rabbi Moses inquired of Rabbi Abraham, where has his son gone? He is standing by the door, he replied. Go and call him, he said, while re-entering the door. Whereupon he came across the child, who again recited the form of address, peace. Yeah, peace is the formula which ends any, almost any letter. So it seems that for the writer, the most impressive part of Maimonides' house was the Iwan. I talked it at, uh, we talked about it uh, previously, on which Maimonides and his son were seated, and which is mentioned several times in the letter. Iwan is a slightly raised portion of the floor, generally extending from each end of a room. It was probably a very intimate part of the house, since the writer considered it a great honor to be invited to sit there. The other part of the house, which remained imprinted in the writer's memory, is the vestibule, the, the dailies, which led from the entrance door to Maimonides' chamber, chamber with an usher, Purdada, positioned in it. The dihilis separated the public sphere outside from the intimacy of the private home. Our writer remembered it because it was the liminal space of transition between the ordinary outdoor into the privacy of a unique home into which he felt very auspicious to be invited and received so warmly. It stood in his memory as a space of liminality which separated the daily world from the very special place where that which a book would prove insufficient to describe transpired. The memory of another house was memorialized in the poetry of the celebrated Spanish philosopher and poet Judah Halevi. When Judah Halevi approached his 50s, he decided to abandon what seemed to him his previous hedonistic and bohemian way of life. As part of his repentance, 
he chose to perform a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Around 1141, he embarked upon a long journey across the Mediterranean from Spain to Palestine. When his ship arrived to the port of Alexandria in Egypt for an, in an interim stopover, he was received by the local Jewish community with great enthusiasm. The warm hospitality he encountered in Alexandria and Cairo convinced him to remain in Egypt for the year before continuing his pilgrimage to the Holy Land. In this way, many of his letters and other writings of this year reached the Cairo Geniza and were preserved there and kept until discovered by Goitain in the 70s of the previous century. Judah Halevi's main host while in Alexandria was Rabbi Aaron ibn el-Amani, a rich court, court physician, a local judge, Dayan, and one of the prominent leaders of Jewish community. Judah Halevi thanked him for his very generous hospitality by composing several poems in his praise. In these poems, as well as in some prose letters, Halevi admitted that the lavishness of Ibn al-Amani's house tempted him to postpone the pilgrimage and to extend his stay in these luxurious surroundings. In the laudatory poems Halevi wrote in honor of his host, he described the extravagance he indulged in as a guest of Aaron. His luxurious house with its beautiful garden and the fountain in its midst received in these poems special attendant, uh, attention and were depicted minutely. And I hope you, by now you already have your handout. Thank you, I'm sorry. And uh, you can have it, it's number two in your handouts. Uh, the most fragrant oils and balsam, the choicest spices and delicacies, a sculpted garden with a fountain in its midst, in a gentile valley and by a flowing brook, a mosaic floor in an enchanted glade, tiled in gold, the waters of the vale empty up, up, upwards above a canopy of myrtle, and birds and doves, companions and lovers, and roses and spices old and new, the soul shall indulge in all delicacy, on beautiful dishes and from overflowing jug. And also, I came to 12 springs in Noamon, that's the biblical name of Alexandria, and to 70 date palms, to a house of delicacy of cinnamon and spice, and to an orchard of henna and nard. And still more, in a more prosaically way, in a letter to Rabbi Samuel Hanagid, the head of the Jewish communities of, of uh, Egypt, he met me with grace, Judah Levy writes, and delicate generosity, with gifts and a house of repose, a sanctuary with a spacious alcove, a tabernacle and a domicile, a table and a candel candelabra. I indulged in the comforts he afforded me. I was surrounded by his exquisite foods, low beds and strong pillow. Let us dine on delicacy and become intoxicated in his pleasures. The house is hence revealed as a powerful agent which triggers human actions and emotions. A central place in Halevi's poems is dedicated to the miraculous fountain in the garden, which empties the water upwards, to use his words. Magnificent houses, fountains, were an indispensable part of the caliph's palaces in medieval Egypt. They symbolize the majest majesty, and wealth, majesty and wealth of rulers. Nonetheless, the luxurious ways of the rulers seeped down to the religious and commercial elite who adopted and imitated their lifestyle. The fountain, the extravagant fashion of fountains was not confined only to the big central cities of Cairo and Alexandria, but spread around and reached even the peripheral parts of the Fatimid Caliphates. Archaeologists in Israel have recently unearthed an estate outside the district of Old Ramla with a fountain and a plumb plumbing system which was found almost intact and complete. 
Chagit Torge, excavation director of, on behalf of Israel Antiquities, Antiquities Authority, believes that the fountain would have deco decorated the home of a wealthy family's garden in the 10th century. Ramla, during the Fatimid era, was the capital of Junt Philistine, a peripheral and secondary province of the Fatimid Empire. It had a large and very active Jewish community of Rabbanites and Karaites, and it tends is, it is very probable that the villa with the fountain system belonged to a local Jewish to local Jewish residents in Ramla. Now, since this is our very last meeting, I think we are entitled to have a small celebration. So, after showing you the house and the garden, I would like to offer some food as well. Unfortunately, the Geniza is quite silent about food, which makes me always very sad. <laughs> when food is discussed, it is either in a moral or medical matter. While Muslim literature offers a whole genre of cookbooks with recipes and descriptions of whole dishes and meals, no single description of a specific Jewish meal or any meal was so far, so far found in the Geniza. Anthropologist Mary Douglas suggested that food, just like, like language, should be viewed as an ordered system. And the relation between the various dishes that constitute a meal should be studied and understood as a kind of grammatical syntax. Now, in face of the total silence of our Jewish sources about any complete meals, such a study on food and food waste on the Geniza society is almost impossible at this stage. The little that can be done is using the many shopping lists found in a Geniza in order to reconstruct some of the dishes consumed by, by medieval Jews on various occasions. The following manuscript is a list of food provisions for the Feast of Tabernacles, Shavuot written, as you can see very carefully, by Solomon, the son of Judge Elia, who was also the community clerk. It's, it's a very elegant handwriting. And um, here you have the translation. It starts with the title, Expenditure for Pentecost Chavuot, if I live so long with the help of the Almighty. Now it starts with small chickens or little chicks chickens for one dirham. A dirham, like the drachma, is the smallest value of, of money. Uh, chickens were the, the daily meal. That it was, they were consumed regularly during, during the week. Um, it was easily acquired and easily to be fed and raised. Um, now, afterwards, we have meat for one and a half dirham, more expensive. Now, when it says meat, it always lamb. This is the regular meat, otherwise it will be specified. Um, lamb was preferred to beef and was therefore more, more expensive. Further on, we have a pound of fat tail, a tail of a ship called in Arabic and in Hebrew, liya or alia, for half and a sixth dirham. Uh, this was the most expensive part of the uh, most expensive meat because it was uh, a fat, uh, the tail of the sheep. Uh, but it was very essential in Mediterranean uh, uh, cuisine. It was intended for frying the meat and the vegetables. Now, even in modern Middle Eastern cuisine, the liya or the aliyah is used in this way. And um, if you know, uh, Claudia Rodin's Claudia Rodin's book on Mediterranean cookbook. The almost any recipe starts with an introduction, uh, instruction: fry some lia fat, and this is the beginning, the very basis of any uh, any uh, recipe. Then we have here a hen of one and a half dirham, probably another dish for the same meal, and there we have garden mellow or meluchia for half a dirham. This is the Molochia, it's a plant. Its botanical name is 
Prochorus oleotirus. It is still widely cultivated in Egypt, in Palestine, in Syria, and is made into a very thick soup, which is considered to be the national dish of Egypt. Um, in the Middle Ages, it's interesting that it was called al bakla al the, the, the Jewish vegetable. But anyhow, nowadays, it's a typical national uh, Egyptian uh, dish. Um, Claudia Rodin, actually, whom I mentioned earlier, um, in, in her book, in the introduction to her book, by the way, she herself is a native of Alexandria and spent most of her childhood in, in Alexandria. And in the introduction, she, um, she describes some, she mentions some reminiscence of her childhood, how the Felachin woman used to go to the fields and bring in the in the big jars on the head, uh, soup for the husbands, the the um, the, um, uh, the peasants in the worked in the fields. Um, I think I'm the only person who reads introductions to cookbooks. <laughs> um, further on, let's go back. We have uh, kubeb and garlic for eight dirham. Um, Cubeb, at this plan, uh, is a spicy fruit, or piper cubeba, a spicy fruit growing in southeastern South Asia and dried from, um, uh, in a dried form, serving also in medicine as a stimulant and also as a, a diuretic. Uh, since here it is listed among uh, other spices, so here it probably used for a kind of spice. Uh, then sesame oil for a quarter of a dirham, eggplants for half a dirham. Eggplants, by the way, were brought to the Middle East from India, but long time ago, already in the seventh century during the Islamic occupations, and became very, very, very popular vegetable till now. Then we have sesame oil for half a dirham, and this is not a mistake. The repetition of sesame oil once. It doesn't work well. You can see that once and again, sesame oil. It's not a mistake. Yeah. One out a measure of oil, first of all for the molochia and then for the eggplant. So it's listed twice for each of the each of the of the dishes. This is for the first day, which is Friday, and for the Shabbat. A lemon hen, two dirhams. A lemon hen is a hen cooked in lemon sauce and spices, still very, very popular in all over the Mediterranean and uh, the Middle East. Claudia Rodin, page 182, very good <laughs> recipe. Um, then you have chard, which is a kind of uh, leaf beefs for three, eight dirhams. Um, onions for half a dirham, safflower for quarter of dirhams, green lemons for half, half a dirham. What's not mentioned here is bread. Uh, so I guess, I guess that it is because the, the court clerk who wrote down the list, as uh, being a community official, received bread uh, each month or each week, as, as a matter of fact, as part of his function as part of his service to the to the community but uh, generally speaking bread was perhaps the most urgently needed life-sustaining food and the mind of the average man was constantly preoccupied with providing his household with bread in times of low nile and other disasters befalling agriculture famine at, uh, Epidemics, anarchy, such anxiety, anxieties were natural. But the Geniza letters seem to betray that state of mind, even when the prices reported seem to have been quite normal. The insecurity surrounding the most basic food of the, popula of the population influenced the organization of its daily life and affected its th thinking. Whoever had the means to buy wheat at harvest time led in a, led in a sufficient supply for the, whole, for the whole year. The wheat was ground at a local mill and the dough prepared at home, but baked at a, at a bakery outside the house. 
New Eastern bread is um, and was and still is flat, round. Is it's actually a pita and soft, so um, to be easily broken by hand, no knife needed, into pieces which can be used instead of forks or spools for picking up morsels from a train, from a tray. Um, I'll skip up another shopping list, um, but I would like to share with you uh, how much time do we still have? Okay, uh, perhaps uh, a few words about fruits after having after having the the uh, dinner. Uh, uh, we may we, we are entitled to to enjoy some fruits. There's an incredible incredible choice of uh, of uh, fruits that are mentioned in Gen in Geniza um, in Geniza letters documents. Um, most of them are, were important imported. Uh, we find apricots, peaches, palms, uh, a lot of all kinds of nuts and almonds, walnuts, pistachios, hazelnuts. They were all brought to Egypt from various places, from Syria, from India. Um, and some of them uh, were turned into sweet meats and candies. A sweet meat, A sweet, sweet meat called the uh, kadaif, made of almonds, honey, fine meal, and sesame oil, is very frequently mentioned. And nowadays, you may know it as kadaif, as a kind, and it, it entered also the European um, uh, kitchen. Now, um, this combination of almonds and raisins was recommended by Maimonides as a suitable food for scholars. Raisins and almonds probably remained alive in Jewish folklore since my own parents, who never set a foot in any Middle, Middle Eastern country before immigrating to Israel, used to, to put me to sleep with a lullaby about raisins and almonds and not in Judeo-Arabic. <laughs> so dates were another kind of fruit. Uh, indigenous, this was an indigenous fruit of Egypt. They were consum consumed regularly. And Maimonides recommends honey made of good fresh dated mixed with water taken with bread. Um, honey was used for the preparing sweets together with fine white flour and melted butter, butter it made the acida. Uh, very well-known thick cake, still very popular in many, many Arab countries. Uh, fish, we have a variety of fish, local fish and even imported fish. Uh, cheese, also a variety of cheeses, both local and important, and they are mentioned in many, many um, uh, Geniza um, finds. Uh, never, nevertheless, other dairy products are hardly mentioned and were probably very rarely used. Um, on the other hand, there is abundant information about olive oil, uh, which was uh, indispensable, an indispensable accompaniment of bread. Now, uh, zeit, which literally means olive oil, Olive oil became the general word for any oil in Arabic. And we've seen in the previous list that when he means another kind of oil, he will specify it. Unless, yeah, and when he says just zayt, it's, it's, uh, it's generally uh, um, olive oil. Now looking back on the foodstuffs consumed by the urban population, as revealed by the Geniza, we are impressed, as with clothing, by the cosmopolitan character. Most of the oils and nuts and much of the cheese and honey were important. Important, Even widely used vegetables as egg blends and fruits um, and other foods like bananas had come from the remote east. Spices and medical plants came from all over the world. Um, perhaps we still have time um, to share together a recipe of good wine. I won't let you live without a good recipe for uh, good wine, but um, this is this is the, the document. Uh, but perhaps perhaps I should um, I should um, say that uh, of course, if you if you wonder 
how comes that we have wine in a Muslim country. So of course, wine and other alcoholic beverages are forbidden in Islam. And there can be no doubt that in the course of the centuries, this prohibition was indeed honored. But during the Fatimid era, the ancient tradition of the Mediterranean era, where wine was almost a basic constituent of the regular diet, just as bread. And uh, at this time, the, this was much, this um, uh, tradition was still very much alive. And wine was still a fait de civilization uh, and was very openly sold as well. We have in Cairo and in Alexandria the street of the wine cellars. And, an ex and, and um, a foreign traveler noticed that fresh grapes were hard to come by because they were mostly made um, into wine immediately. Um, so, and wine was indeed um, consumed on a, on a regular basis, on a daily basis, by, uh, by Jews, by Christians, and certain kinds of wine, th those kinds of wine which are not uh, made uh, by, out of uh, um, grapes, were also used by some, uh, some Muslims. So here we have a, a recipe, it's your, in your handout, uh, number four. Uh, you may try it at home. Take two and a half dirhams weight of each of the following. Uh, lichen, it's a kind of fungus or moss, uh, ginger, pepper, and barley flour, and half a dirham of saffron. Mix all these together, bound them, and bind the mixture with the same quantity of Egyptian bihani, and put it aside. Put two and a half dirhams weight of this together with one uh, dirham of colophony. Um, into each jar and plaster it over. Leave it in the sun for seven days, after which it can be used. If you wish to have vinegar, put only one and a quarter of this stuff into each of the jar, leave it in the sun for 11 days. So here you can have either raisin swine or, uh, or, or vinegar, uh, whatever suits you, suits you better. Um, one normally ate two meals a day. A light morning meal, Radha, and a more substantial evening meal, Asha. Meal was served on a maida, a large tray placed on a stool. No chairs were used. People used to sit comfortably on the floor or on cushions. There is a rich nomenclature of houseware. Dishes, bowls, cups, glasses, and a variety of pots and containers, but there is no mention of spoons, forks, or knives. At the end of the, me of the meal, it was customary to sprinkle those present, and in particular the guests, with rose water. A necklace bottle named kumkum -kum was used for this purpose. In Arabic, kum, and in Hebrew as well, kum means uh, get up. So kum kum will be get up, get up. And the joke said that sprinkling of the guests with rose, rose water was a sign that the party was over and everybody was advised to go home. So our party is also over, but don't go home yet. Still time for questions. Thank you very much. I think we have some time for questions and a a mic will be passed around. Yes. or a servant, or is there any? Yes. And who, um, whose guest why, during during the dinner, planned to rob him, and uh, oh. it's yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. I I find it a beautiful picture indeed, it and the, this person, the, the 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 figure of the of the servant is did 
dividing the picture into very, very clearly into two parts. Yes. Monic. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes, it's a servant. Absolutely. Miriam, what are we learning about mixing of Muslims and Jews and perhaps Christians as well in the homes from either from the Geniza or from other other sources. Is it so? The so scre uh, fraternate, fraternization between uh, Jews and Muslims and Christians in in the habitation in, in the in the dwelling. In the dwellings. <laughs> yes. Right. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think. Yeah. There are several. Yeah, as you know, <laughs> there are several testimonies for social relations between all <coughs> denominations. Um, I think that more. I, I'm not sure, but I suppose that mostly between people of the of the intellectual class. Yeah. There are a lot of intellectual. Uh, ties, connections between um, Jewish savants, Jewish scholars, Muslim scholars, uh, and Christians as well. Yeah, quite recently, Ronnie Volant wrote a very interesting article about intellectual relations between um, religious, religious, uh, religious uh, uh, leaders, Christian religious leaders and Jewish religious leaders who, who, who studied together, studied together Bible and uh, exegesis and, uh, and so on. So I, I guess that the dwelling, the joint dwelling was not just living one beside the other, but also it included also um, uh, social relations as well. Thank you, Miriam, for a wonderful lecture. Um, I'm curious about the uh, lack of, uh, of recipes or complete meals that you referred to. Um, I've also looked for them in vain. Um, I've noticed the shopping lists, and I've kind of struggled to find an explanation for this. Is it because recipes were orally passed down, or can you think of some other reason? Yeah. You're relating to the wine, to the wine recipe? No, to, I mean, to the previous one. Yeah, the previous thing that you mentioned that you just, you don't find cookbooks or, or listings of how to actually prepare food. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's not a recipe, as a matter of fact. Yeah, we make it into a recipe. It's not a recipe. It's a shopping list. It's a it's a list of the expenditures of uh, Nathan Ben Shmuel uh, for Shavuot, for uh, for Pentecost, uh, for the Feast of Pentecost, and he he, he he writes down in a very uh, uh, very pedantic way uh, all his expenditure. Uh, we can. We can reconstruct out of it a kind of recipe, but it's not a recipe. It was not written for the uh, for the purpose of uh, for the use of uh, of the kitchen. Yeah, it is actually a list of expenditures, um, and uh, we we can see out of it exactly. We can reconstruct the meals, um, and so on. So do you think that there were actually recipes that got written down as recipes, and we just don't have? Most of the recipes, like the wine recipes that I've just shown, are actually recipes for remedies, for medical, medicinal remedies, um, uh, but not for, not for food, not for dishes and meals. Not so far. I still hope one day to find something. But, uh, not so far. No, I don't think so. I think you are quite right. That, uh, they were transmitted or transmitted orally. Uh, who did the cooking? I wonder whether it was because the cooks were illiterate. Well, uh, here we, here we, uh, you may expect a surprise. It was generally cooked outside the house uh, by specialists who, who were normally men yeah. uh, in the market, in the bazaar. And the whole dishes, whole meals were brought up to, to the houses from the bazaar. It's still the habit. It's still habitual in many Middle Eastern <laughs> cities, even, even nowadays. Uh, but women in the house did very, very little cooking. As far as I can understand, yeah. oh, so it, it was specialist, yeah, and it was very professional, and uh, there were uh, specialists for each kind, each kind of food and each kind of sauce and uh, and uh, so on. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I was wondering, in your research, have you ever seen um, illustrations of men and women eating together? Mm. <laughs> no, no. I guess they didn't eat together, or at least they were not, they were not described yeah, in, in pictures as, as eating together. Mm. But we do have, of course, in, in Muslim literature, we do have um, testimonies for parties, you know, royal parties with singing girls around and, uh, and so on, but this is not, this doesn't reflect the history. Or the domestic. Uh, not the domestic uh, sphere. Yeah. Thank you. You know, on television, they have these contests where they bring together three or four different chefs and they give them <laughs> the ingredients and see what they come up with. So why don't you try that? Then you can find out what you're eating. Good idea. I like it. So on that note, let's all thank Mary and my dad.